Hi, I'm Laura Briggs, Director of Public Policy here at Fantini Research, and we're here today with Keith White, who is the Executive Director of the National Council on Problem Gambling. Keith, first, thank you so much for being here and taking the time to talk with us today. Oh, thank you, Laura, and I'm really glad to be here. Well, this is an important time to hear from you because as many people who are watching know, March is Problem Gambling Awareness Month. And so, Keith, if you can just tell us what is the biggest issue involving problem gambling here in the U.S.? I think right now the biggest issue is making sure that we have the infrastructure in place to handle this massive expansion of gambling that we're going through. And, you know, there's, it's been a mixed bag. A number of states either had program problem gambling programs in place prior to expansion, and, you know, many of them added uh, money from these new sports betting and online gambling bills, but about a third of states uh, didn't add any public funds to prevent or treat or mitigate the, any in, increases in gambling problems yeah. even when they've expanded gambling. So I think that's, that's the key issue to focus on, making sure that we get expansion right. Right. Yeah. And as we've seen in uh, other governments, such as the UK, where they're starting to have concerns over problem gambling, that are coming back and they're restricting things like bet limits and, and gambling advertisement. And we wanna make sure here in the US that we're kind of staying ahead of this. Would you say that the American gaming companies are learning from this and staying ahead of the curve or do you think there's more they can do? I think American companies are learning, but I think that the base level of responsible gambling in the United States is so low that, that it's sort of this tale of two cities in that, yes, everybody wants to avoid the backlash. And I think some companies are, are doing quite a lot. You know, some companies are really in the lead, but that allows others uh, in the industry to coast a little bit. And, um, and again, state governments aren't doing their part. So mm -hmm. while the industry as a whole has embraced responsible gambling, um, you know, certainly as, as, a, as a public goal, uh, when you really look at what's being done and when you look at industry operating in states that don't have any problem gambling programs, you see that there's still there's still some gaps we need to fill in. If if we because if we truly want to avoid the backlash, the biggest lesson from the UK is it doesn't matter what your leaders are doing, it's what the least are doing, oh. and and that's where I think our industry is most vulnerable. It's it's a somebody that operates in a poorly regulated state. You know maybe it's a it's a new operator. It's an operator that that, that is not really embraced responsible gambling. They're going to cast that black brush. Um, all, all over the entire industry. And yeah. that's going to be, I think, where, where the problems happen. Yeah, I agree. What do you think there are, um, what do you think some like example policies that uh, regulators or legislators can put in place to sort of mitigate the harm as states are kind of expanding um, or at least trying to expand to more digital options now? I think one of the biggest things that companies can put in place is an actual responsible gambling plan. You know, when I was at the American Gaming Association back in 1998, we developed the Responsible Gambling Resource Guide, which, which takes, us, takes us back a while. But even then, the, one of the core principles, one of the core recommendations in the Responsible Gambling Resource Guide was you have to have a plan. You know, it has to be more than a public statement. It's got to be an actual measurable plan with both budgetary, you know, resources and measurable outputs. And frankly, for most companies, having a director of responsible gambling one person within thousands who's, who's in charge of this, I think those are two really good important steps. And I think when investors, uh, regulators, the media look at a gambling company with 10, 15, 50,000 employees, and they see that there is no, you know, if you can't hand them your responsible gambling plan, and if it's not, does, doesn't have money attached to it and measurable outcomes, yeah. and if there's not someone there in charge, that company probably has a lot of work to do. Yeah. So you've mentioned to me in the past that there's a need for responsible gaming measures to be incorporated into things like predi prediction games, like fantasy sports, esports, social casino, possibly loot boxes fall into that category. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about that? Absolutely. We think that there's a real need for responsible gambling in this constellation of arguably not legal activities that surround the industry now. And as you mentioned, things like daily fantasy sports and prediction games are often offered with lower or no age limits. Right. Uh, they have few, if any, responsible gambling features, but they often carry companies' logos and brands. And they're very deliberately designed, you know, not just as marketing um, services, but also, you know, some of them in these free-to-play systems, you can actually make a lot of money off the games. And right. so we think for gambling micro transactions. <laughs> yeah, microtransactions are huge. Yeah. You know, and so for a gambling company, there's some exposure there. Um, if, you're, if your name and brand is being associated with activities that are uh, gambling in all, in all but name, 
mm -hmm. uh, where you're making money off it, um, but you're you're catering to younger players, you're catering to vulnerable players who don't have the same protections. Uh, I think that that's a critical issue for the industry. And in many of these platforms, it would be so easy to integrate responsible gambling. Right. You know, it's it's the the stance seems to be we'll only do responsible gambling where we're made to. You know, not you know we're not going to extend responsible gambling to all our brands and products unless someone forces us to. And that's, I mean, I understand, I guess, why that happens, but it's it's a pretty big indictment on a culture of responsible gambling at a company when you've got to force them to apply it across all their products and services. Right, yeah, that's a, that's a great point. Um, yeah, I think, you know, what you mentioned on our last call too about um, people who are investors wanting to responsibly invest into companies that are responsible um, with these types of things. So responsible gambling, I think, um, you know, those having those measures in place will go a long way for um, enticing investors to also become active. In I mean, when you look at ESG, the movement towards ESG, um, investing and, in, you know, sustainability, uh, I think when you think about reputational risk, uh, when you think about, you know, avoiding negative settlements, uh, you know, I would suspect that a company that has a comprehensive responsible gambling plan that they extend across all their products and services is, right. a, is a much better, much better risk than, than one that doesn't. And, yeah. um, you know, so, so again, I, I think it's, it's long-term, it's good long-term value. You know, it's, it's both good ethics, but it's good economics. And yeah. I think companies that are poised to be really successful are the ones that are that are doing the right things, not just checking the boxes, but really live this as part of their mission. You know, it's either part of your your operation and culture, or it's not. Yeah, good point. Well, you've made some great points here in our short amount of time. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Well, I do think you know there's a lot of positive going on. You know, there've been there's been a great move over the last decade in in U.S. companies embracing responsible gambling. We're seeing a lot of uh, competitors that push in from the U.K. Uh, have a high standard of responsible gambling. Yeah. And so, you know, it is it is a glass half full. There's been a lot of progress. And I think we need to continue to build on that, as well as to remind operators that while it may not be your obligation to make sure that there are problem gambling services in the jurisdictions you operate, it becomes your problem if there's not. You know, so if you operate in a jurisdiction where there's no public funding for problem gambling services, all the responsible gambling in the world is not going to cover up the fundamental problem that it, your players are not going to be able to get help. And that is going to rebound, not on the regulators or the government who fails to provide those services, but usually on the operators and vendors and not in a good way. Yeah, absolutely. Great point. All right. Well, again, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. Obviously, this is an important topic to the gaming industry, and we greatly appreciate your insights. Oh, no, and um, it's my pleasure. You know, the National Council is designed to work in partnership with everybody so we can help fill these gaps. You know, it's not just leaving companies on their own. You know, we want to play an active role in helping the U.S. industry get to where they need to be. Yeah. Well, thank you, Keith. I appreciate you being here with us today, and I hope you have a great day. Thank you, Laura. I love working on the policy stuff with you, so I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, I, I enjoy all. It's always an educational experience, so thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>